to take over. Fifteen years before, when the tycoons had been buying up companies, the banks had played a minor role. But now, the banks were in charge. Now, they targeted old companies and financed entrepreneurs who then bought them up. Factories were sold off and thousands of workers were sacked. Everything was done to increase profits and maximise the return to the shareholders. It helped to fuel a growing boom on the stock market. It was the ruthless reconstruction of British industry by the power of the market. I think they saw the opportunity to make large amounts of money. That's what they saw. Because unshackling capital just gave them the freedom that they wanted to do essentially whatever they wanted. They looked back to a golden age of capitalism when there weren't any upper two unions, when there weren't Labour governments that wanted to prevent them from doing all the things which they'd traditionally done. Then you can create boom conditions. They set out to reconstruct it. But then, into the midst of this boom, came a very unwelcome ghost from the past. Tiny Rowland. Ever since the crash of 1973, Rowland had been shunned by the establishment. But now he saw in this takeover boom an opportunity to restore his reputation and to make a great deal of money. And the way he was going to do it was to take over Britain's most famous department store, Harrods. Harrods represented respectability and a very excellent commercial enterprise. Everyone looked up to Harrods. People were coming from overseas to shop there and the name of Harrods, and it promoted the owner of Harrods, was something which he felt would in fact achieve one of his aims, acceptability. But Roland was not acceptable to the merchant banks. They were running the takeovers and he was the sort of entrepreneur they knew they couldn't control. He also represented a seedy and corrupt past, the unacceptable face of capitalism, which they wanted nothing to do with. They were different. They were the new enterprise culture. He was the sort of person who was seen to be, thought to be involved in corrupt ways in uh, uh, ever since the um, you know, the Edward Heath statement in Parliament about the um, unacceptable face of capitalism and that sort of thing, it was seen to be, in the words of 1066 and all that, a bad thing. Unreliable character and questionable motivation. An inappropriate owner of such a crown jewel. Couldn't trust the fella. The banks did everything they could to stop Roland. They persuaded the government to refer his bid to the Monopolies Commission. One of the few other companies that Roland owned in Britain was a firm that made nylon bedsheets called Brentford Nylons. The Commission argued that if Roland bought Harrods, he would then have a monopoly on the sale of nylon bedsheets in Britain. So they blocked the bid. It was an absurd ruling, but the government accepted it. Well, I thought it was totally absurd, um, and the city press thought it was totally absurd, and Tiny thought it was that the true motivation was they didn't like him, and nothing would persuade him after that that the true reason was not the reason given, but simply a matter of personal animus. They didn't want Tiny to have House of Fraser. Roland knew that he had been stopped because of his corrupt past. He was furious because to him it was the height of hypocrisy. Roland knew that underneath the new shiny enterprise culture, there was a growing mass of corruption. Corruption on a far grander scale than anything he had indulged in. I became a fraud squad officer uh, sort of about 1980, 1981. And within a very, very, very short space of time, I, I, I became utterly amazed at the, at the level and the degree and the volume of fraud that we were being asked to investigate and uncover at a time when um, this climate of enterprise that had, been, that had been unleashed by the politicians had just really started to get into its stride. 
wherever you looked, there was this tide of sleaze. But of course, nobody thanked you for bringing this to the fore. Nobody wanted to discuss this. We saw avenues of investigation being, being blocked, prosecutions not being proceeded with, um, the director of public prosecutions not proceeding with certain kinds of prosecutions, using the phrase, well, it's not, I mean, sometimes they would say, well, it's not in the public interest. There was this enormous sense that as long as the markets are given free reign, we don't want to do anything that would be seen to stand in their way. All of us in politics have dreams. It's part of mine to give power and responsibility back to people. Popular capitalism is a crusade, a crusade to enfranchise the many in the economic life of Britain. And that is the kind of society I want to see. Politics became compromised by the power that was unleashed by the new climate of enterprise. Thatcher and Tebbit had seen this sort of road to the New Jerusalem through, through freedom of markets and had unleashed it and had, had let it loose without, I think, without realizing the, the, the kinds of all the sort of dangerous and damaging spin-offs that would happen. But then suddenly, the Thatcher government came face to face with one of the other effects of deregulating the financial markets. And this time, it was an effect they couldn't ignore. 25, 26, the market. 25, 26, the market at the moment. At the end of 1984, the government faced its first big currency crisis. Speculators on the international markets began to sell pounds and buy dollars because of high interest rates in the United States. There was nothing the government could do to stop them, and they watched helplessly as the pound slid to almost one dollar on the foreign exchanges. And then it got worse. The richest man in the world, the Sultan of Brunei, announced that he was going to shift ten billion pounds to America. Mrs Thatcher faced disaster. She turned for help to the Sultan's representative in London. She sent her private secretary, Charles Powell, to see him. Margaret Thatcher, during the crisis, she knows that the uh, Sultan of Brunei is a friend of mine. Charles Powell coming, he met me several times to, in my residence in Park Lane. Please, can you help us? Because we're going to take the reserves, about 10 billion sterling to uh, one of the American banks. Can you help us? I took the plane, I stayed. Two weeks begging the Sultan. He accepted. I came back, called Charles Powell, he came to see me, I said, it's okay, the funds are not gonna be moved. He was so happy, and then he said, Margaret Thatcher is very grateful, and please, in the next visit, when the Sultan comes here, you are invited to have a chat with her to turn down the street. I say fine. Mohammed Al Fayed now became an influential figure. He was invited to dinner at number 10. Fayed had made his money out of the oil price rise in the 70s. He had been a middleman, arranging enormous contracts in the Middle East. But now, in the new unstable world of global currency flows, British politicians needed someone like Fayed. He had a new kind of power, the power of international money. It would be very hard to think of Mr. Macmillan, Sir Alec Douglas Hume, even I think Edward Heath, giving Mohammed Fayyad the time of day. They wouldn't even have received him number 10. The imagination boggles at the idea that somebody of Mr. Al Fayyad's, uh, what shall we say, background would have had the red carpet rolled out for him. Now suddenly, uh, a person who can be of assistance in adjusting the pressures of the uh, financial international community on a sovereign government becomes, in a way, a player in his own right. He becomes somebody who makes the wheels go round and you either let him down there with his lubrication or perhaps you hit the buffers. And Mohammed Al Fayed now claimed his reward, Harrods. In early 1985, he made a takeover bid, and a grateful government waved it through without a murmur. 
fired, paid £570 million in cash.